Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Chinnery. I'm here from Cornell Cooperative Extension in Troy, New York. And we're doing one of our Lunch in the Garden webinars, which we started back in the early part of 2020. And we certainly appreciate folks tuning in and being here for these. We do them on Wednesdays at noon. And uh, here we are, and we're kind of winding these down for the summertime now. Uh, we'll probably restart maybe in the later summer or the fall, but we're actually kind of celebrating maybe the end of the pandemic with a very special program today on hostas. And we were just commenting that we've got folks from all over the country really uh, here at our hosta lunch in the garden version of our program. So this is very exciting for us. We've got 103 people online so far. Um, we're going to send you all an email about how you can watch this video again after it's recorded and edited. We're going to be posting it on our Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to YouTube and type in Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County, and that's a lot of words, um, you'll come to the recording. And then I will send you a link by email as well. That will take a couple days to do that. Um, and you're welcome to go back and watch the video over again if you have any questions or, or maybe miss something. So uh, that's uh, how you'll find us again. Um, another housekeeping uh, tip I have to talk about is that if you have questions today, you can type them in the chat box. So Marcy, who is here today with us, and I will be watching the chat box and uh, we'll be answering the questions at the end uh, so we don't interrupt Dave too much. Um, when we get to the fertilizer part, we may ask Dave a question or two right at that moment, but otherwise we'll keep the questions towards the end. Okay, now Marcy, do I have any other housekeeping or is that pretty good? Nope, that sounds pretty good. I'll be watching the chat box. I'm gonna mute myself and hide my video. That sounds good. Well, today we have a very special guest here, um, and I'm very pleased to have Dave Jennings, uh, who's a Master Gardener volunteer with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Saratoga County. Uh, Dave served as the Horticulture Extension Educator here in Rensselaer County, where I am, for almost 10 years back in the 1980s after completing his master's degree in horticulture and education from Cornell University. Dave retired a few years ago from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, where he was for over 20 years a pesticide, pesticide control pesticide. specialist. So Dave has a wealth of knowledge in horticulture, uh, pest management, all the different things we do here at Cooperative Extension. It's really great that he is a master gardener now. He's kind of been with the family for a long time, which is wonderful. And he is the man that knows about hosta. When he pulled up in his car earlier this morning, Hosta is on the license plate. So if you see that Hosta New York license plate, you know it's Dave Jennings out there. So Dave, uh, tell us a little bit about your horticulture experiences and especially how it relates to the world of Hosta, which is one of my favorite plants. I'm glad to, David. Um, we started chatting before everybody got signed on, so I'm gonna revisit a little bit of that. But my wife and I have been growing hostas, well, literally since I was a little boy. So that's, you know, over 60 years now. And we've got about, probably about 300 plus varieties just in our half acre garden here. We actually had a little hosta business that my son started when he was in high school, when we lived just down the road. But five years ago, we built a new home and I moved most of my favorite varieties with us. But over the years, we've probably grown about 500 different varieties. And I had the opportunity to bring two complete U-Haul trucks full of plants with me when we first moved. And most of them are doing well. So they've been in the, they've been in the garden now for about five years and they're finally starting to take off. Um, I'm also um, um, president at one time and the co-founder of the Upstate New York Hosta Society and currently serve as a newsletter editor. So um, we've actually got a lot of experience with hostas. And um, the one thing, like David already said, is we're going to actually um, send this out to you afterwards. So don't feel that you have to take a lot of notes as you go through it. There'll be one page with all kinds of good information on it. And uh, when you see that on the screen, then you're gonna wanna go from there. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen and we'll get started. 
Um, right now, Marcy, it's not letting me share the screen. Okay, I'm gonna come on over. Okay. It's saying host is not enabled you to share screen. Oh, okay. So Dave, you gotta do that. Okay. So, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that, Dave. I got a. That's all right. I got That's why we've got backups here. I gotta promote you up again. Uh, I'm gonna make you the co-host. That's that was my fault, folks. Okay, so you should be a co-host coming up. Okay, there we go. Uh, the technology is going to work. That should do it. Ah, uh, beautiful. Looks great. Okay, sounds good. So that tells you a little bit about myself. And like I said, don't feel you have to take a lot of notes because you're going to get this presentation afterwards and you'll be able to you know, write down what you want as we go through it. But you'll see it's got all kinds of information. The first thing I want to do is just thank all the people that sent me pictures or gave me permission to use their pictures. The American Hostage Society has about 4,000 people on its Facebook page and we share all kinds of great information there. And so these are some of the people that gave me permission to use you know, their photos in today's presentation. Um, if I left anybody out, I apologize, but I would uh, certainly like to use it. You can send me a note and I'd be glad to give you credit. But this is probably the most important slide you're going to see all, all of the presentation. It talks about the local upstate New York Hostage Society. It talks about the Tri-State Hostage Society. It talks about the Hostel Library. And on the Hostel Library, you can actually go there and you can take a look at pictures of about 8,000 different varieties of hostas and uh, summer growth, and spring growth and flowers and size. And they're all listed alphabetically. And then of course, there's the American Hosta Society as well. And so this is one thing that you wanna keep um, and, and have down for your references as far as looking at future things. There's also a wealth of information and references out there. And these are just some of my favorites the encyclopedia, um, the hostopedia. Uh, the hostopedia alone is about three inches thick. And so it's a, it's a wealth of information. And you can uh, find most of these in your local bookstores. So I'm gonna get into the talk itself right now and talk a little bit about hostas. And like I, well, we already shared with you, if you see something on fertilizers and you've got a question on fertilizers, then by all means put it in the chat room or interrupt me. But don't ask me about propagation yet, because we're gonna cover that later in the presentation. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how hostas get their names. Um, back in the old days when hostas were just starting to get popular, they only had botanical names or Latin names, like uh, Tocodama ebulinosa, or nebulosa, or um, Sibolian elegans, or Montana aurea marginata. So they were all Latin derivatives, but the breeders, the breeders actually had a chance to start giving hostas common names. So you could name a hosta after Antilles, or you might have one called, um, you know, um, Elvis Lives, for example. So you could give a hosta any kind of name you wanted to. And then they started having improved varieties of that hosta. So they had first frost and they had an autumn frost. And so hosta popular names are, are probably the most common way right now. Or if you see a hosta that looks really funky, um, this person actually just simply called it Wee. Um, and it's W-H-E-E. -E. And so this hosta in particular, if you kind of look at it, you'll see it's got all these twisted leaves. And so they use their imagination to come up with a name for that one. This is one of my favorites. It's called Lakeside Paisley Print. Now Lakeside designates the kennel or the stables that it came from. So the hosta breeders have their own breeding program. And so all the hostas produced by this one breeder start with the name Lakeside. And so there's a lot of them out there where you'll see the first name of the hosta is actually the breeder's 
the breeder's kennel or stable, so to speak. So this one is called Lakeside Paisley Print. And if you look at the leaf, you can very quickly see why they came up with that name. And so this is another one of my favorites. And as you can see, there's all different kinds of hostas, sizes and colors, textures, you know, everything from one called Paradigm, which is kind of a large hostas to some of the giant ones like Empress Wu or Sun and Substance or Winter Snow. And you can see the size of that leaf compared to this person's hand. Now the smaller hostas doesn't mean that it's a young hosta. It just means it's a miniature. And in my last presentation, we went into a lot of detail about the, the sizes of hostas. So if you didn't get a chance to see that presentation, then you can send me an email and I'd be glad to send you a link for the first one. But this is kind of part two. So I'm not gonna take a lot of time talking about sizes this time. But hostas are kind of funny because nobody knows how much to charge for a hosta. And one of the latest trends in hostas is trying to come up with something different. So this hosta actually has a red blush to its leaves. And so when it first came out, the breeder was charging a lot more for the hosta for the first few years because everybody wanted one. And this is a variety called First Blush by Bob Solberg, who's a breeder down south. But over the years, breeders have taken that hosta and crossbred it with others. So this one is an improved version, or at least some people think it's improved, with a little bit different color. So hostas are not supposed to have red leaves. They're blues and they're yellows and they're greens and they're streaked and they're variegated. So this is one that's actually been crossbred. It's first blush mixed with garnet spires. And so it's a, it's a deeper burgundy. But one of the things about this hosta and the one above it is it loses that color later in the season. And so hostas change throughout the season. For instance, this example here is one called either white wall tires or white feathers. And when it comes out of the ground in the spring, it's pure white. Now, for those of you that know anything about plants, plants have chlorophyll in them, and that's what makes them green. And as you can see, this hosta at this point in time, the chlorophyll has developed. So if this hosta stayed white, it would die. It would not have a chance to live and thrive. But what happens is within a couple of weeks after this hosta comes out of the ground, it starts to turn green. The chlorophyll develops and it will survive. So it's, it's one of those hostas you wanna put in your garden where you can see it early in the spring because later in the season, it's pretty boring. It's just pure green. Um, this is another unique hosta. You know, hostas do not normally have those white veins. And so the more interesting the hosta is, the more expensive it will be. The other thing that drives up the price of a hosta is when it first came out. When a hosta first comes out, it might sell for $100 or $200 or $300 a piece. I think the record for anyone being paid for one hosta was $8,000 at an auction. The American Hosta Society gets together every summer, and as part of their meeting, they have an auction. And the breeders and the really, you know, enthusiasts come together. There's usually four or 500 of us, and they're, it's held all over the country. And one of the fun things is the hosta auction. And there was one variety called humpback whale that sold for $8,000 to the first time it was released from the breeder. So that's kind of interesting. Now this host on the other hand is not real. And I put that out there for illustrations because there's no such thing as a pink hosta, but I've actually seen it in many catalogs where they've actually colored it or changed the color and promoted it and said, you know, you've got to have this hosta. People get fooled into ordering it. And it's not, it's green with a white center. So you got to be careful. You know, uh, you got to kind of beware out there a little bit, even when it comes to buying hostas. Hostas though, on the other hand, are produced from seed, cross pollinators, they're bred. They'll take plant A and cross it with plant B and they'll come up with new varieties. But hostas have a habit of mutating. And so in this illustration here, you'll see that June, which is the variegated hosta, is actually reverting back to the parent, which is a blue hosta called Halcyon. So what you have to do with these is every few years, you have to dig it up and divide it and separate it to keep it pure. This is a variety called Crosa Regal. And Crosa Regal is getting this sport in the middle or this mutation. 
Um, I don't even know for sure what this one was called. And then likewise, this version is called stepping out around the outside and it's getting a mutation in the middle. And so you would have to divide that out. So many hostas come from sports and mutations. You'll also see that the variety here on the left was called strip tease. And you can see the little strip of white in it. It's just a little tease of white in the leaf. And that's how it got its name. But it mutated into a yellow center. And so this one here was called Gypsy Rose. But strip tease also mutated and came out with this version. This is a version called either erotica or snake eyes. And you'll see it's an improved version of the original look here. This has kind of a bluish cast to it. And the one that's really popular right now and very hard to find, in fact, if you can even find it, it sells for well over $100, is one called Quiet Waters or, or Wally's Bullfrog. Now, some people look at that and say, oh, I don't even find it attractive. Other people have to have it in their collection and will pay whatever price it is to try and get it. So this hosta is so out of this world with a different look that it's probably gonna sell for $1,000 when it finally comes out. That hosta is a white hosta with a little bit of green in it, but a nice bright red center. And there's no other hosta on the market, anything like it. The parent was called Lady in Red. And so you'll see this sport here in the center. And it, it's actually being grown right now in the Netherlands. And the gentleman that grew it is Ari Bloom. And he's trying to propagate it, but so far not having much success. And so right now, the only way it can be obtained is by a division. And it has a habit of reverting back. But the one thing about it is I already said to you is that all this white the plant really doesn't survive on its own unless it changes color. So later in the season, it's going to look like this. But it is rather interesting early in the season. And like I said, once they get this into propagation and are able to mass produce it, it's going to be a very expensive hosta for collectors. Now, there's also a group out there called the, the American Hosta Growers Association. And each year the growers get together and they nominate plants that they really like. Now the hosta has to be reasonably priced. It has to be readily available. It has to grow well in all areas of the country that you know, hostas grow in. And so there's a whole list each year of hostas that become the hosta of the year. And that started back in 96. So for this year, the plant on the left here is Rainbow Zen. And so that is the 2021 host of the year. The one on the right is Island Breeze. So the growers got together and everybody kept submitting names. It got down to the final three of Atlantis, First Blush, which you've already seen, and Island Breeze. And Island Breeze was named the host of the year for 2022. So there's a lot of things that make hostas so interesting. Um, this is one called Ivy Coast. And you can see it's bright golden color. Uh, this is one called Bridal Falls. Uh, there's another one out there called Niagara Falls. But you can see if you threw water on this leaf, you can kind of imagine it cascading down the leaf through the veins. And so that's why the first one was called Niagara Falls. And with its nice bright wedge, this is called Bridal Falls. One of my absolute favorite hostas out there, though, is one called Goodness Gracious. Now you'll notice after the name of this hosta that some of the hostas out there, and there's probably about a hundred of them so far, that the breeders have actually put a plant patent out on, which means that royalties have to be paid to the breeder in order to be able to propagate that. And so this hosta is only available by permission from the breeder. And so each time that plant is divided, the breeder gets a royalty from the sale of that hosta, or, or even for each time it's propagated. It doesn't even have to be sold. So it's illegal for anybody to propagate this plant without paying a royalty to the breeder. And so there's about 100 hostas that fall into that category. And this is one of those. Now, some hostas are absolutely huge. Um, this is an average-sized person. I don't know if she's 5'6", or, 
or 5'4", whatever, but you can see the size of this hosta. This is one called Empress Wu. Um, it's a bluer hosta, but it gets humongous. And like I said, the one that I have in my collection is, uh, is even bigger than this, and it's a variety called Humpback Whale that I got as an originator stock plant um, from the person that paid $8,000 for it. I won it as a door prize at a hosta convention. Now there's all different kinds of hostas. I'm just gonna show you a few examples of some of the smaller hostas like dragon tails, and cracker crumbs, and little treasure. And this is just to show you some of the diversity of hostas. Uh, little sunspot, uh, one called peanut. And, and this hosta only gets about three or four inches tall. And then there's one out there called tattoo. And if you look at the leaf here, a close up, it's almost as if somebody put a tattoo of a leaf in the middle of the hosta leaf. Now some hostas are harder to grow than others, and this one's a challenge. So this is not a hosta for a beginner, um, but if you're gonna pay $100 for it, you're probably gonna give it more tender loving care for one that you, know, you only paid you know, five to $10 for. Now, when it comes to placing hostas, the choice is yours. Some people like to spread them out and give them lots of room to grow. Other people like to get them closer together. And so in this instance, they've actually massed them so that they're about three or four feet apart. And you can actually do a whole hillside with just hostas as a collection, as you see in the lower left here. But some people will take their garden and plant them in masses or in sweeps as it's called. So this is one variety here. Around the angel is another variety. Back here is another variety. Over here is another variety. So instead of putting one plant in a collection, they'll put 10 or 12 plants together. And, uh, but once again, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So if you like them spread out and you've got the room for it, then go for it. But you know, I prefer something either halfway between this or this. I'm a collector. So I probably got about 25 plants in my, in my collection that I have more than one of. You know, um, Lakeside Paisley Print, I happen to have six of. Goodness gracious, I have 10 of. But most of my hostages are one of a kind because I like to collect hostages. Now, the other thing about hostages is that they change during the season. You can take a variety like June, for instance, and you can give four plants initially, they all look exactly the same. You can plant one in morning sun, one in a little bit of afternoon sun, one in deep shade. And within a year, every one of them will look different because hostas respond to the amount of light that they get. And they also respond to changes in the season. So this hosta is called first frost. It comes out of the ground with this orange edge. Then, a few weeks later, it starts to lose the orange edge. And by the end of the season, the orange edge is disappearing and you have a creamy colored edge. Other hostas look fantastic when they come out of the ground, like Golden Meadows. But it loses my infatuation by late in the summer. This is a close-up of what it looks like in the spring. By midsummer, it's looking like this. And by the end of the summer, it's lost all that yellow golden color. Now, I still like this hosta. It kind of has a drawstring edge on it. It's still two shades of green, which you have to admit that the hosta above here and this hosta don't look anything at all alike. Now, everybody always wants to know, how do I grow such big hostas? And there are some people that say, hostas shouldn't be fertilized because a hosta under stress will have its best color. I'm not a firm believer in that but I'm not a heavy feeder either. One of my favorite fertilizers, and I don't mean to endorse anything here, but this is the one brand that's out there that I know of that's actually made from sewage sludge and it has an odor. And so be cautious with this where you put it because after a couple of rains, you're gonna smell it when you're sitting on the deck. But the one good thing about it is the animals smell it too. So rabbits and deer don't like the smell initially and will stay away from your plants. Um, you'll find with a lot of them, you don't even have to put out a repellent if you use something like this. But hostas are, um, they're a monocot, which means there's not a dicot, 
They don't have two leaves when they come up. They come up like a corn plant. And so the veins all are parallel. And so because they're related to grasses with uh, being monocots, they like a high nitrogen fertilizer. And so you'll notice that the second fertilizer here is, uh, is very high in nitrogen, which is its first number. It's always N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So this one is 27% nitrogen. There's no phosphorus in it and 2% potassium, N, P, and K. So this would be a fertilizer that also has some iron in it, which makes the plants a little bit darker, especially the green ones. If you want an organic fertilizer, well, there's plenty of organics out there. This is a less expensive one, just a common 1064. Um, and this is one that's actually labeled for lawns and trees and shrubs and, and perennials. The one thing about this illustration down below though, is this is a little too much fertilizer too close to the plant. If you're gonna put fertilizer on, follow the directions on the bag and put a band of it out away from the base of the plant, a few inches. You can scratch it into the surface, but if you put too much on, you'll burn the roots. So make sure you follow the label directions. Now, a lot of people are in a big hurry to cut the flowers off of their hostas as soon as they bloom. I don't like doing that. First of all, the hummingbirds love them, and I love them because they're pollinators. And there are blue flowers, and there are almost white flowers. There are pink flowers. The most common hosta flower, though, is lavender. Sometimes you get a strange flower coming up on this one called praying hands, and this is a faciated flower head, so it's not normal. But there's all kinds of flowers out there. Uh, this is my son when he was much younger, still in high school, standing with, next to a variety down here called Victory. And this is actually not him holding a cut flower. This flower comes all the way up from the ground. He was almost six foot tall. So the flower spike on this hosta was approaching seven feet. Now it flops over though. And so a lot of people would find that very messy and would cut it off. But on the other hand, hosta flowers are all over the place as far as color, and size and texture. And even the flower buds are interesting. This one hasn't opened yet. So this is the flower bud on this hot. And um, some of them are heavy bloomers. Some of them have very fragrant flowers. There's a whole series out there of the plantagenias um, that have very fragrant flowers. And I could walk out in my backyard from 50 feet away and smell the odor from these. And, and some of them look very attractive, very heavy flowers on this one. And they come in all different colors. As I said, this lavender color is the most common. This is a bicolor, a burgundy with a white edge. Here's a, a, a multicolored a white edge with a blue center. And this is one of my favorites. This is on the fancy versions of Plantagenia, either called Venus or Aphrodite. And this is a double or even triple, very fragrant scented hosta. The one problem with this one is that it's not a good bloomer. And um, only like once in five years do you get it to bloom. And it happens to like very hot summers. So if you get a summer with you know 10 degrees of 90, and then this one blooms in August, then this will be a good year for its bloom. But other years, the flowers start to form and they just abort. So next I want to switch gears and go to pests because we get a lot of questions on pests of hosta. Now this one, everybody confuses because this critter that caused these mounds or these tunnels is not a pest of hostas unless the tunnel gets too close to its roots. And this is the tunnels caused by moles with a capital M. And then these tunnels are more surface tunnels. And these are called by, caused by a critter that starts with a capital V called a vole. So these are more surface tunnels that you'll see in the springtime when the snow melts. They have holes, they go underground, but they don't tunnel the way a mole does. And they like to eat the crowns of a hosta. And so this is a crown that's been eaten by a vole. They, they chew it up. They eat the actual fleshy part of the crown. The leaves fall off, they don't eat the leaves, and you'll see the leaves just flopping over. So the critter on the left that looks like a type of a mouse 
or a meadow mouse is called a vole. The printer on the right is called a mole. They don't look anything alike. This spends its life cycle underground and tunnels, and you can see the feet on it. This runs around on the surface and then digs down when it gets to the, the hosta clump and chews up the crowns. So this is the vole and this is the mole. And if you look at these mole feet, you'll see why it's so good at tunneling. It's practically blind. It has a pointed snout that makes it easier to tunnel underground. Now, there's a lot of things you can do to protect your hostas from these critters called the vole. And the way I remember it is moles eat meat and voles eat vegetables. So the moles are feeding on the grubs and the earthworms. So if they're eating your grubs, they're beneficial except for the tunneling. But the voles, on the other hand, they eat a lot of vegetables. It can be a real problem. So I like to buy these, these garbage cans from the dollar store. And they come in three different sizes. This is kind of the larger size. It's about 12 inches in diameter. And it's a metal mesh wastebasket coated in plastic. And I'll dig a hole, like you see on the left. I'll put the mesh basket down in the hole. I'll put my hosta into the mesh basket. And I'll leave the basket sticking up above the ground about two inches. And then I fill in the soil around it. So when the vole here goes running across the surface, he comes to the basket, it has a two inch lip, and he goes around the basket instead of hopping in to eat the crown. And so I've got that friend down in New Jersey that has 2,700 varieties of hostas, and he's got actually 90% of his clumps of hostas in these baskets. Now, if you can't find the baskets, or the hosta gets too big for the baskets, then you can make a basket. And this is quarter inch wire mesh. You just roll it out, attach it together, and we just sew it together with you know, either zip strips or you can use a fine piano wire, put it in the ground again. You want it about 12 to 14 inches in height. And once again, put your hosta in the middle of it, and then around the edge, fill the soil in, but leave the edge of the wire mesh ring about two inches above the soil. But make sure you use quarter inch mesh because when these voles are little, they could actually squeeze through half inch. So buy the, the wire screening from your hardware store, but get the quarter inch mesh size. Now, a lot of people will try and control these with traps. They'll put out bait stations, and the choice is yours, but the baskets are pretty effective. And so a lot of people would choose to do that instead of putting out traps or bait stations. This problem though is a major concern now in hostas. And it's a more of a problem if you buy from, and, and I hate to say this, but some of the big box stores that produce hostas by the, the thousands because they're not able to control or take care of or prevent this virus infection called HVX. A good breeder or the smaller operations, they buy plants from, from breeders that have been virus indexed that are not infected with this virus to start with. And so when you mass produce hosta and sell them to the big box stores, you can go, and I'm not gonna name any names here, but you can go into the places that are in this area and every now and then you'll find a hosta you know, that looks like this or this or this. And those are actually infected with a virus called HVX. And we all know with viruses that there's no pill you can pop or spray that you can put on them to make the virus go away. So once you get it in your garden, it can spread. And so the only thing you can do is get that hosta out of there right away. Hopefully it didn't spread to any others and make sure you sterilize your tools when you do so. Use a one to 10 solution of, of, of a, a bleach solution to sterilize your tools because if you have the juices from this hosta on the blade of your shovel or on your pruners or your clippers when you're cutting the flowers off, you can spread it to your other hostas. And so this is a real problem. And so this HVX, you know, if you get it in your garden, you're gonna to wanna to get it out right away 
And that's another reason why when you buy a hosta, you might want to isolate it, grow it in a container for a while, just to make sure it's not infected. Because I've seen people that put hostas in their garden that they didn't know were infected. And two or three years later, the virus finally surfaces and then they've got a problem. And so it's a real, it's, it's something you don't want. I've never had it in any of my gardens, but I have seen it in friends' gardens and had to advise them to get those gardens cleaned up as soon as possible. This is a close-up of what it might look like. And if you go to that hosta library site that I talked about earlier, you'll find all kinds of information on all kinds of problems. And the virus explanations in there is excellent. Now, sometimes a hosta looks like it might be infected and it's not. This TB4 looks like it might have a virus, but it's not. But the only real way to tell if your hosta is infected at the early stages is to test it. And they make virus test strips. There's only one company sell them called Agdia. And on that hosta library page, you can buy these test strips. They come with a bag to crush up the leaf, you uh, make it a mashy, you know, soupy mess. You put the test strip in it. And if the test strip shows up the indicator, then you'll know that that plant is infected with the virus, even though it's not showing signs yet. You know, these plants, you don't have to test because it's obvious. But if you get a plant that you think might be infected, let's say it has one leaf that looks like this or this, you know, you might want to test it just to make sure. And the test strips, you know, they're not cheap, but they're not expensive either. They come in sets of five for you know, $35, $30, you know, something like that. But if you've got a hostage that you paid 100 bucks for and it's starting to show signs, you might want to test it. Or even if you've got a hostage that you know, grandma gave you, you might want to not put it in your garden if you think it's infected. And the only way to know that for sure is to test it. Now, one other problem that hostas have is hail damage, okay? And so another problem that looks a lot like hail damage though, and if you haven't had hail, is something called slugs. So this hosta looks like it's just been peppered with little pieces of hail, but in reality, it's been chewed up by something called a slug. And this would be a severe infestation of slug damage. And this is what the slugs look like. They're snails without shells. And there's all different kinds of slugs out there. But they all cause this kind of damage. Now, there's a lot of people that will take and try and control slugs by picking them or collecting them. So if you put a, like a one by six out there, you know, just an 18 inch piece of board between your hostas, the slugs will hide on, under it during the day. And first thing in the morning, go out there and pick the board up and scrape the slugs off. You can also get some stale beer and put it in a saucer, push the saucer down into the soil so it's flush with the surface and the slugs will be attracted to the beer and either fall in and drown, or I like to say they get so inebriated that the next morning they don't have enough sense to get out of the sun and they die that way. But there's also slug baits out there. And so you can buy a box of slug bait. There's all different kinds. Some of them are uh, more organic than others. Some contain a pesticide. Some contain a food source and a pesticide. And you can sprinkle them around your garden. And the slugs or snails will be attracted to it and take it in the stomach poison and die that way. The number one enemy, though, of hostas, I think, is deer. Uh, this is a deer with a hosta leaf in its mouth. Um, I know people that the only way they can grow hostas is to put up eight foot fences around their entire hosta garden to keep the deer from jumping over it. These two hostas look fine today, but tomorrow they look like this because the deer came in that night and ate all the leaves off. And they don't eat the, the $5 hostas. They go for the $50 hostas first. I can't explain it, but they'll leave the popular undulatas alone and they'll go after the $20 and the $50 and the $100 hostas. They like the soft tissue and the taller hostas first. They don't seem to bother much with the little miniatures. 
maybe they just don't like to bend over that far. I'm not sure why. But this is what the hosta looks like. Literally, one deer can turn five or six clumps of hosta into just stems in one evening. So some people put up fences. And a, a short fence only works good if you get it close to the plant so the deer can't leap over it. Rabbits, though, also are a problem for hostas. So this one was actually fed on by a rabbit. Now you'll notice he left the plant in the background alone because for some reason he seemed to love this one. We've got four or five rabbits running around our neighborhood and of my 300 plants out there, I lost about 20 of them this year. Now, if the, the plant still has this many stems, it's still got plenty of leaf surface to make chlorophyll or for the chlorophyll to do photosynthesis. So that's going to come back as long as the rabbit doesn't chew it down three or four years in a row. Now, some people protect their hostas when they're first coming up in the spring. So this person saved their nursery pots and when the hostas were first emerging, they put them over it to protect them from the rabbits. But it does another thing. Hostas sometimes come up too early in the spring and there's a danger of frost. So you can protect your hostas with a frost blanket or you can put these pots over them and that will help protect them until they get too big to be covered by the pots. So that's another thing that people might want to try to either protect them from the rabbits in the spring or to, or to protect them from late frost. In our area, the average frost date is around May 20th. And some of your hostas will start coming up by mid-April. And so if we get a heavy frost in late April or early May, a lot of people like to cover them to protect them from frost damage. Another problem with hostas is something called cutworms. And this is what, this is not slug damage, this is cutworm damage. And this is what a cutworm looks like. It's a caterpillar. Um, it's a problem on peppers and tomatoes, a lot of plants in the vegetable garden, but it can also be a problem on hostas. This is what he looks like when he's all curled up. This happens to be the black cutworm, and there's a lot of different kinds of cutworms. But because he's a caterpillar, he becomes either a butterfly or a moth, and this is what the adult moth looks like. And so uh, because he's a caterpillar, you can control them with something called BT, um, your bacillus thuringiensis, which only kills caterpillars. So that's the one thing about controlling your caterpillars. And, um, and, and that's one thing you might want to keep in mind, that you want to do it when you first see damage. You wouldn't want to try and control them when they're nice big adults because it's not as effective. When you first start seeing damage, that is called the action threshold. And that's when you would want to put the controls down for your cutworms. All right, can anybody guess what these are? Well, since you can't answer me, I'll tell you. These are on a hosta, and there's two stages of the life cycle. You see these yellowish orange things? Well, over here on the side of the leaf is the next stage of the life cycle. And believe it or not, these are ladybugs. And so ladybugs are beneficial insects primarily. And so this is what it first looks like when it emerges, and then it becomes this scary looking creature. And these are also the common name called an antlion. They kind of look very ferocious, but what's happening is this stage of the insect feeds on these things, and these are aphids. And so you don't wanna control, you know, control this stage, even though it's on your hostas, it's not gonna cause any damage because this is what it looks like when it matures. And these are all different kinds of ladybugs. You'll see orange ones, you'll see black ones, you'll see some with spots and some without spots, but this is a beneficial insect. So don't try and control your ladybugs. And we're all seeing news articles now on these. Now, luckily here in upstate New York, it's not a problem, but if you start traveling south, to the mid-Atlantic states, these are all over people's hostas and their sidewalks and their windshields. Uh, you know, President Biden even had one on his neck when he was getting off the airplane the other day, if you watch the news brief. And so these are not an insect that eats hostas. This one happens to spend seven, spend seven years, 17 years 
in the ground is a grub. And so this is just coming out to mate and lay eggs. But in the mid-Atlantic states, they're all over everything. So one of my friends who grows hostas sent me this picture. Another problem we have with hostas is called nematodes. Now, nematodes are a little tiny worm-like creature that you can't even see with the naked eye. And so they'll bore between the layers of a hosta and eat the, the guts out of a hosta leaf, so to speak. And so this is what it looks like if you have nematodes. And you'll see on these leaves, the inside of the leaf is actually chewed out, leaving this brown streaking. Now, many years ago, we had systemic pesticides that would control the nematodes. But there isn't anything on the market right now that's a, a systemic that's going to do a good job of controlling your nematodes. So once again, never buy a hosta that's infected with nematodes. Or don't trade for your friend with one that might have nematodes because it can spread and there's no known consumer controls for it. Now, some hostas really hate the sun. Hostas are not a shade-loving plant. They're a shade-tolerant plant, which means that they love a little bit of morning sun, but they don't like to be in the hot afternoon sun. You can go once again to that hosta library website, and they'll have lists of hostas. Hostas for wet feet, hostas for dry conditions, hostas with fragrant blooms, hostas that tolerate more sun, blue hostas. And so you can find all kinds of lists. But this hosta in particular, if you give it too much sun, it gets this burnt edge to it. And this is a scorch. This one, on the other hand, is from drought conditions. And so you have to be careful with that. This is hail damage on the hostas. You'll see a few holes in the leaf. This is heavy hail damage. This happened to be my garden two weeks before a big tour. The one thing about hail damage is I tell people, in spite of how ugly they look, leave them alone because whatever leaf surface is left is still going to make strength for next year's plant. If you cut them off, sure, they'll send up a few new leaves, but you're better off to leave the damage there, let Mother Nature take its course, and they'll be much happier for it next year. What I'm going to do last is talk a little bit about propagation. We'll probably call it quits so we have time for some questions. But most hostas now are produced from what is called tissue culture. So people will take, well, picture a celery stalk. The celery stalk, there's five of them on a bunch of celery. When you peel all the celery away, you're left with a heart of celery. And when you get down to the heart of a hosta, it's actually got mirror stem tissues. People will take those mirror stem tissues and cut them up into little tiny pieces about the size of the head of a pin. They'll put one little piece of hosta heart in a test tube with an auger solution, which is like a clear jello. And what it does is it differentiates cells. It grows into this green blob. It starts to send out roots. It'll start to send out shoots. And pretty soon you've got a, a clump of little tiny hostas growing inside the test tube. Then people will take it out of the test tube and they'll separate out all those little shoots and they'll put them in trays. So these are little tiny baby hostas in half inch cells inside a tray. And there might be a oh, hundred of them in one flat. They grow them on for a few months and then they transplant them to bigger pots. So these little tiny cells of hostas are transplanted into four inch pots. And so it went from the tissue culture to the half inch cells to the four inch pots. And that allows people to take a beautiful hosta that they paid a thousand dollars for and come up with three or four hostas, three or 400 hostas in a very short period of time, which they can turn around and sell for a hundred dollars a piece. And so hostas are mass produced and marketed at trade shows and, and um, flea markets, just like you see here. You can also buy hostas mail order. So they'll take them out of these pots, they'll rinse off the soil, they'll wrap the roots in paper towels, they'll put them in plastic bags and they'll ship them to you 
two to three day priority meal and they arrive in great condition. And so you could buy Hostas meal order now this way. And so this person, you know, you can count them, you know, bought a dozen or so Hostas meal order. Everyone's a different variety. You know, they paid, you know, $20, $25 for shipping and they got all kinds of Hostas that just aren't available locally. And so that's another way you can buy Hostas or you can buy them from local producers. Um, this was our little backyard business when my son was much younger. We sold them in six inch pots, but you can buy them in six inch pots. You can buy them in one gallon containers. You can buy them in three gallon landscape size. The bigger the hosta, the more you're gonna pay for it though. Another thing that I wanna talk about is, is propagation of hostas by divisions. So this big clump of hosta, some people never divide their hostas because they want the clump to keep getting bigger. Other people though, want to share their hostas and that's why it's called the friendship plant. Other people love this plant so much, they want to have six of them. So the, the springtime, they'll take it out of the ground and they'll chop it into six pieces. Now this is the time when I like to divide hostas in the spring when they're just emerging from the ground. They go through less transplant shock that way. And so you can also take your clump and just cut a piece off, leave this part in the ground and separate it by cutting it in half or cutting a third of it off and taking it out of the ground, filling the hole in with topsoil, and then leave this in and take this part and plant it in a new location. So you can actually divide your clump of hostas. But once again, by doing them at this stage, they go through less transplant shock. You can do it any time during the growing season, but know that if you do it when it looks like this, it's gonna look ugly for the rest of the growing season. So a lot of people either do it in the fall, say in early September, when it's not gonna look ugly for months, or they do it in the spring when it looks like this. So if you take it out of the ground, this is what you're gonna have for a mature hosta, you know, say 10, 15 years down the road. And this is a can of soda to show you the size or the scale. You could actually take your Sawzall and cut it up or a good butcher knife or a spade and cut it up into pieces or you know, a good steak knife, a good heavy duty steak knife. And you can actually divide it into small pieces. You get a piece of the crown. It doesn't hurt to cut the crown, cut through the crown with a couple of shoots. Um, this is one that you can actually pull apart without having to cut it. And you can see that this is a division and these two are a division. And this is probably another division. So when you pull it apart, you've got these smaller divisions to put out in the garden. And so that's another good way of dividing your hostas. You can also do hostas for seed propagation. So they're pollinated, the seed pods form, they can be purple, they can be yellow, they can be green, they can even be streaked. And if you want streaked seedlings, then look for streaked hosta seed pods. This is what they look like when they're ripe. They split open on their own. The seeds start coming out of the ripe pods. If they fall to the ground, you'll have a bunch of weedlings or baby hostas under your plants. And sometimes you get lucky and come up with something really unique. This is a street hosta. Uh, my friend Jeff actually came up with a seedling that he called Garden Goddess. He entered it in competitions and won all kinds of prizes for it. But this is a seed that he got from from his hostas, that's something unique and something exotic. Um, here's another example of what they look like when you grow them with seeds. You can grow them indoors, you can put them in trays, grow them under lights. This is what they might look like when they first come up about a month after planting. You'll see there's yellow ones and green ones because they don't look exactly like the parents. Some of them will look like the grandfather or the grandmother or, or Aunt Tilly. And so these could have all come from one seed pod or one plant. So they don't necessarily all come looking exactly like the parent. And in fact, they never will with only a couple of exceptions. When they get a little bigger, you, you transplant them to bigger trays, you keep track of them, you tell you, know, you write down who they came from. If they're open pollinated, then you collected the seed from just one plant. If you cross pollinate them, you wanna know who the mother was and who the father was. And this is what they look like 
when they're ready to transplant. And sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you come up with something that looks like this. And this is the most popular hosta out there right now, the street versions. This one sold in the open hosta auction recently. And the parent that gave it the streaking was in particular one called Golden Sand Supreme. And so this is what it looks like up close. And that sold, well, actually a second one sold recently for over $300 just in the past few weeks. And so you hope it's gonna stay like this. You hope it's gonna be stable. If it starts throwing up green shoots, then you wanna separate them and try and keep it clean. All right, I think we need to stop right there, David, and not go to a couple other slides that I had. I think these are probably the most important topics, but I do want to leave some time for questions. Well, thank you, Dave. Wow, we covered a lot of ground, and this was just fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it myself. I've got about 25 hostas, and I've just learned a tremendous amount from you, so I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you being here kind of as our last speaker of the series. And uh, I just want to say thank you very, very much. And I do encourage people, if you've got questions that we don't answer, that you send me an email. Um, like I said, I'm very involved in the Upstate New York Hostage Society. So the easiest email, email address to remember is unyhs at aol.com. I'm still a good old AOL user. But UNYHS, it stands for the Upstate New York Hosta Society. Um, I monitor that email box and I'd be glad to answer questions that way. If you've got a question you didn't feel like asking or you think of it later. Um, do we have questions right now we want to address in the chat box? Yeah. Uh, before that, though, do you want to give a shout out to maybe people joining the local Hosta group? I mean, are there Hosta groups all over the country, I imagine, right? Yeah, there's actually two local groups, and the uh, third slide in this series gave both the email address and the website to join. The Upstate New York Hosta Society is only $10 a year. We have about 75 active members. We have guest speakers and garden tours, plant sales. You know, even during the uh, pandemic, we did a, a few sessions on Zoom and had guest speakers via Zoom. But now we've started doing garden tours again. Uh, we've got a couple of them planned this for this summer. So if you go to that at unyhs at aol.com, I can send you some membership information. But we also have what's called the Tri-State Hosta Society, and that's a New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey group. Uh, we just had a great meeting down in uh, northern New Jersey for that group uh, this past weekend with about 50 people from about five different states there. And we had a members only plant sale. And um, I came home with a half dozen hostas to add to my collection from that. And of course, uh, that's part of why it's called the friendship plant because people really get addicted. Um, I like to refer to the people that are addicted as hostaholics, <laughs> just kind of a fun terminology that we refer to ourselves as. But yeah, definitely go to that third slide in this series and you'll find all kinds of connections and links and information on, um, on references of the Hosta Library, the Tri-State Group, the Upstate New York Group, as well as the National Hosta Society. And for the American Hosta Society, there's about 500 active members. And uh, they have a conference somewhere in the United States every year. I've had the opportunity to go to about 10 of them since I started collecting hostas. And uh, I've been to Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and Washington, D.C., and South Carolina. And so, you know, I'm definitely addicted. And so uh, it's a lot of fun to get together at those conferences. Yeah, that sounds great. I am going to go home and write a $10 check to you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> group. I'm, you can't I'm, beat it. I, it sounds wonderful. And I know you guys are very uh, active, so it sounds like a, a lot of fun. I think this has been a lot of fun for me. And I want to thank everybody who was in attendance today as well. Uh, Marcy, do you want to read out the questions or I can do it? Uh, it doesn't matter to me. I do want to mention that I did put that website lower down in the chat box, the UNY, whatever that was. YHS. Yep. And I put that in the chat box so people could see it if they needed Excellent. to. Excellent. Appreciate it. Thanks, Marcy. Okay. You're welcome.
Well, maybe Marcy and I can take turns uh, reading the questions. We've got one here that says, how many total varieties of hosta are there? <laughs> well, that's a fantastic question. The answer is nobody knows <laughs> because there's, a, there's about 7,000 registered varieties. So there's actually a registry, an, an international registry of hostas. So the breeder produces it, they grow it for five years and evaluate it. They send in all the characteristics to this national registry. Um, it only costs them $5 to register a hosta. They give it a name. And then it's, it's known as that hosta forever. So Elvis lives or strip teas or whatever. So there's about 7,000 registered varieties. But you can imagine that a lot of hostas are produced that never get registered. And, but a lot of them are readily available in the trade. So there's at least another 7,000 varieties that have common names that are readily available that people didn't choose to register or just haven't gotten around to registering yet. But nobody knows how many more are out there. Every breeder produces hundreds of plants a year. They cull them out, 90% of them go in the compost pile and they keep 10% to grow on to evaluate. And so um, here in the United States alone, there's thousands and thousands of varieties. You know, this one doesn't even have a name yet. It's just brave attempt type golden sand supreme. Somebody bought it for $225. They're going to grow it for five years. They're going to give it whatever name they want. They may choose to register it, but it's just you know, one of literally thousands and thousands of varieties that are out there. Wow, that's impressive. What are your favorite vase-shaped hostas? Well, once again, if you go to the hosta library, you're going to find a list of them. <laughs> Um, I like the blue ones, like Grosser Regal. Um, I like Sagi. I like the improved version of Sagi called Liberty, which is more golden. Um, I like uh, American Sweetheart, which is more upright. Um, but there's, there's just, I could probably, you could ask me my favorite blue, my favorite variegated, my favorite street. And every time I walk through the garden, there's two or three that are at the top of the list every time but my top 10 change throughout the season. So in the spring, it's these 10. In the summer, it's these 10. When they're flowering, it's these 10. And so it was really tough when I had 400 varieties in the garden. And my wife told me I could only bring 50 pots when we, when we moved. You know, that didn't work out. I finally got bushel-sized pots and put four plants in a bushel in order to bring my, in order to bring my 200 plants with me. And, and we literally filled the U-Haul truck twice with just plants before we even started moving furniture. <laughs> and so it's, it's an addiction. There's no doubt about it, but you know, there, I could have a lot worse addictions, I guess. <laughs> I love plant people. <laughs> <laughs> um, why are some hostas sold without being registered? <clears throat> well, it's because hostas aren't required to be registered. Some people don't believe in registration. And so some of the top breeders don't register any hostas. And so it's a matter of personal choice. The plant patent, on the other hand, is a means of letting the breeder get some money back. And so typically when a plant patent is applied for, and it costs thousands of dollars to register a, a plant through the patent office, then the breeder gets say 50 cents a piece every time that hosta is, is divided or propagated. So if somebody's gonna produce a hundred of them, they've gotta pay a hundred times 50 cents a piece back to the breeder that actually patented that plant. So I can see some reasons why people put a plant patent on it, but as far as registration, that's totally optional. And so a lot of breeders either just don't get around to it or just don't believe in it. Um, but some breeders, register every hosta they want to mass produce. And, um, and then, so it's a matter of personal choice. I think that's the only reason why some of them don't get registered. Okay, next question. Can you control nematoids by cutting off leaves and putting infected leaves in the trash? Um, it's gonna reduce the population, but I don't think you're gonna ever effectively 
get rid of nematodes because they, they're in the stems, they're in the roots, they move from plant to plant. And so, yes, you can reduce the population by taking that infected plant out and getting rid of it, uh, but you're never going to eliminate it totally. So that's why you want to make sure you never intentionally bring it into your garden. Inspect your plants to make sure they don't have any signs of virus or any signs of nematodes and buy them from reputable sources. You know, I hate to keep bad mouthing the mass market or big box locations, but they don't have the opportunity to, to buy only virus index plants or to have somebody constantly inspecting the plants. They're mass producing them and some things are gonna sneak through the pipeline. So I like to really tell people to go to the breeders, to go to the smaller sources, to buy from the places that buy virus index plants to start with, and you're gonna have less problems. Absolutely. Uh, here we have a question about the seedlings you were just talking about, Dave. Sure. Uh, I have a baby, I have baby hostas in my yard, a few feet from the parent. Can I transplant the babies at any time? Um, well, like any transplant, you have to give it TLC if you want it to survive. So you wouldn't do it during a drought period. You do it during, during a heat wave. You, know, you want to do it during the cool, moist period. You want to get plenty of soil with the roots so you don't disturb them. You want to protect it when you move it. You want to keep it out of the sun. So like any transplant, you know, if you're good at transplanting plants in general, then the hostas can be treated the same way. But those are all important characteristics when you're moving any kind of plant. Protect it, lots of moisture, lots of soil on the roots, and uh, yes, you can. But if you avoid the times when you shouldn't do it, the other times should work for you. Okay, uh, here someone's asking how they could get a link to part one. They were not able to attend. And they also said, thanks for a great presentation. Okay. Um, I would say send an email to UNYHS and I'll send them the link. I don't care whether I get 100 requests. That's fine. I'll send the link though, rather than burden. I, I did the other one for Cornell Cooperative Extension in Saratoga County. And so uh, instead of requesting it from them, send the request to UNYHS at AOL.com and I'll send you the link to part one. Thank you. Uh, we had a question about uh, when the plant was reverting, I think. And if, if they do see um, some fancy hybrid reverting back to green or the parent type, um, it says separate or cut the leaves off. Um, maybe just talk about that in another second. Okay, yeah, just a little bit more detail. Uh, when a plant reverts or when a sport comes out, you know, sometimes it's something brand new. And if it's brand new and you grow it on and it's worthy and everybody loves it in your garden, then you can think about introducing it, sharing it, registering it or whatever. Um, sometimes though it reverts. Uh, you saw the one that where the, it was reverting back to Halcyon. And so that's something that, yeah, you have to separate it, you'll have more Halcyons. But if it reverts and it sounds up a, an all green shoot, let's say that, um, Francis Williams reverts back to the all blue elegance. You might want to just keep separating it so that it stays Francis Williams and, and doesn't keep reverting. And so that's one thing that you might want to do. I've grown some streak seedlings uh, that I've had in the ground for about five years. Half of the plant is nicely straight. Half of it is kind of garbagey looking. So I've got to dig them up next year and separate them out compost the ones I don't like and try and get the others to settle out. And so that's one of the problems with mutations or sports is that especially with the streaked ones, you have to keep cleaning them up or they will eventually go back to looking what they originally looked like. And remember, if they come up all yellow or white, they probably don't have enough chlorophyll in them to survive. And uh, so that's one of the problems with some of the yellow mutations is that not all of them will survive for you. And so that's one of the things you might want to keep in mind. But yeah, you do have to keep separating them and they do revert. And But sometimes you get something really awesome looking. I've got a variety of summer loving that's a very good grower that looks a lot like one called Stitch and Time. And so um, Stitch and Time is a poor grower, but the one that I've got that came out of summer loving 
I'm evaluating it. And as far as I'm concerned, it looks as good as Stitch in Time, but it's a good grower. Um, I, and, I, and probably in five years, I'll have some to share. And that one I probably will register. I don't know if I'll ever spend $3,000 on giving it a plat patent. But on the other hand, it's, it's something exciting that I'm looking forward to sharing. Yeah, and then you get to create one of those crazy names, right? Oh, yeah, who knows? You know, the host is still here on the screen. I mean, you know, that's that's... That's a knock your socks off kind of hostel. Uh, someone here is asking if you give tours of your garden, Dave. Um, I do them for garden clubs. I've done them for the master gardener groups. I'm doing one this summer for the hostel society. So if you join the local hostel society, then you get to come on one. But no, it's a very quiet residential neighborhood. And so I don't do them constantly. But if you have a garden club in the area, and uh, they want to do a tour, I'd be more than happy to host that. Um, and like I said, if you join the local hostage society, we're doing one this summer. Good, good. Uh, there's a question about dividing um, at this time of the year. I think you covered spring was the best and now is a little risky because of uh, the plant's going to be bigger. It's not going to have as many roots when you divide it, the heat yep. and thing. Absolutely true. You know, I just divided some dailies and they look terrible right now. Yeah. But on the other hand, I know they're not going to die. They're just going to look terrible this season. If you put them in the ground right away and you give them lots of moisture, they're going to look fine next year. Yeah. And fall is okay. It can be done any time of the year. I just like doing it in the spring because they don't have any transplant shock that way. Yeah. And, and what do you think about fall? Fall's a good time. But fall's one of those things that nobody knows when fall is. It doesn't officially arrive, you know, on one magic date. Yeah, sure, it's September 21st. But on the other hand, um, I like to do them once we get through the hot part of the summer, uh, usually in early September. You know, for some people, fall is Thanksgiving, and that's just too late. Right, right. Yeah, you got to give the roots time to get growing before the soil gets cold. So we're really talking, you know, September, maybe early October. It's kind of like planting grass seed. You don't want to do it too late or you don't get your good germination. Absolutely. Amen to that. And look, I think it's it maybe the last question they're asking how they can rewatch this presentation and um, I can answer that one. That will be on uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County's YouTube channel. Um, you can find it there if you just go to YouTube and you search it or you could go to our website, which is cceresselier.org and there's a link there that you can click to go to our YouTube channel. And I know you said, Dave, you're gonna try and send the link out so they may be able to get it that way too. Right, right, we'll see. Right. Yeah. It does, take, it does take a few days for us to crop it and chop it and make it look beautiful and get it up there. So we're, a little, we're slow, but we're good. So just give us a few days. <laughs> well, that'd be good because I know a lot of people tuned in that couldn't watch it live. So I know they're gonna be looking forward to being able to see it at their leisure. I have actually one other question came in on my email. Somehow somebody found my email and emailed me a question <laughs> that I think is interesting. I think you actually I got like five of them, but you covered most of them. This one's a little different. And I've actually had this question from other people. Um, are there any hostas known to be less appealing to deer? Are there any varieties that really do? <laughs> I find that the deer, first of all, don't like the miniatures because I don't think they like to bend that low. I also find that they love to eat the more expensive ones. Right. And so you might have a whole row of undulatas in your garden, which is one of the more popular old fashioned varieties. And they leave them alone for some reason and they'll go after the more exotic ones. Um, but I found that they're not fussy. You know, if it's, if it's a, a medium to large size hosta where they don't have to bend over so far, those are the ones that they tend to eat first. Um, some people will have a, a row of the less expensive ones out at the back of their property, knowing that if they have enough host out there, the deer will stay out there mm -hmm. and they keep the other ones by the front door where the deer aren't necessarily going to travel as much. But, um, but no, I, I think if the deer are hungry enough or there's enough deer, they're going to eat them all. So the only thing that works is a, a good dog to keep them out of your yard or a, a, an eight foot fence. Um, I've seen people put irrigation out there. So when the deer come into the yard, they get blasted with sound sensitive irrigation heads. 
And so there's there's other things you could do, smelly soap, uh, you know, deer repellent sprays, uh, the, the milorganite sometimes helps. But the one thing, if you're gonna use anything to try and deter the deer, you gotta keep rotating it. So don't only just put out one thing because the deer will get used to it and then just walk right over it. So you know, one week try one thing, the next week try something else. But the only the only sure way is the fencing. And and I know people that put eight foot deer fencing up around their gardens, and that's the only sure way to keep them out. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, so one last person asked about the link to the part one. So if you'd like to get a link to the part one, send Dave an email at unyhs at aol.com. Yeah, I'd be glad to send it out to anybody that wants to see it. And we covered a lot of different things in the first one. That's why this is part two. So I think we're going to wrap up here. And uh, again, we really want to thank Dave for being here. This was just fantastic. A wealth of knowledge, Mr. Hosta. Uh, <laughs> Hosta license plate, people. Watch for that when you're going down the road. Especially There's about a thousand of us out there that know a lot about Hosta, but <laughs> you just happen to get the local guy here this time. Well, Dave is a great educator because he's been uh, in the world of cooperative extension and horticulture education for a long, long time. And you can tell a teacher never really retires. Teachers love to teach, so I would I would say Dave. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to have my hobby and my profession one and the same. Yeah, yeah. And I want to thank everybody for being here today. And um, when we pick up again and do our Lunch in the Garden webinars later in the summer or the fall, I hope you all can join us again in the future. So thank you to Dave and thank you to Marcy. Thanks, and, Marcy. Appreciate it, David. Yeah, take care. Thank you. All everybody. right, thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.